Hello, welcome back to part two of Talking Europe on France 24. We are still at the European Parliament in Brussels and our guest for this part of the programme is a former Belgian senator, now MEP, with the Greens Group, Petra de Sitter. Thanks very much for being with us. Pleasure. Uh, I also want to say that you are a doctor, which is extremely pertinent uh, as the focus of our programmes this week is, of course, the coronavirus COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, it's presenting an almost unprecedented public health challenge here in Europe. And, of course, just a few days ago, we had the, the World Health Organization declaring a state of pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, its director talked about alarming levels of inaction around the world. Do you believe that the European Union, the member states, are guilty of that? Well, it's probably um, not knowing exactly what to do and being um, yeah, having having a little bit of, of reticence, being fearful of taking measures that may be overreacted. Um, there was a, an editorial in the Lancet uh, a week ago that said probably the, in the develop the developed countries, uh, Western Europe, we are going to be uh, doing too little too late and we have to step up. Mm -hmm. And so um, I must say when the parliament then took action, um, because yeah, we are functionally in a, in a kind of a lockdown uh, mm. right now, um, it is probably absolutely what was necessary to do. And there was a lot of reluctance to stop all activities. Of course, the parliament needs to function. And now we are working from home and we have mm -hmm. video meetings and so on. Um, I understand why policymakers are hesitant. But on the other hand, the crisis is that big that strong measures are absolutely needed to prevent worse things from happening. That is the, the question. Well, there is a question, of course, about the degree of uh, measures that should be taken. Uh, there are economic uh, considerations, of course, of course yeah. which we might come to in a bit more detail later. But just looking at, for example, Italy's uh, case in part one of the programme, we spoke to an Italian MEP, Fabio Massimo Castaldo. Uh, there's a, a whole country quarantine in Italy that's been tightened and tightened. Mm. Uh, the former foreign policy chief of the EU is also Italian, Federica Mogherini. She said that she thinks other member states, all of them, should take Italy as an example. Mm -hmm. I think that Italy is um, just a couple of weeks ahead of other countries in the EU and that, you know, in the other countries the epidemic has started later and slower maybe, but that the, the measures that Italy have, has taken probably will have to be taken in other countries as well. We know Denmark also has already mm. strict measures in place and others will be following because the, the less contact between people, the, the less mm. the, the virus can spread. You know about flattening the curve. I think everybody has seen the graphs of an epi epidemic. If you want, can flatten the curve mm. and delay the spread of the virus, you will have much less people affected mm. and you will have much, much less uh, f uh, casualties in the end uh, amongst the vulnerable people. So it's it's not a matter of individual safety. I mean, you can say, oh, I'm healthy, I'm not afraid of that virus. It's about all of us together and mainly the people that are older, the people that have diabetes and other health conditions that we have to be worried about because there's no immunity mm. in our population for this virus. So you can't compare it with a flu epidemic. It's mm. completely different. I think there's, there's a question, though, about how quickly do member states move to different levels of uh, quarantine mm -hmm. or lockdown? Hungary, for example, uh, most recently declared a state of emergency, uh, which uh, permits it to make certain uh, restrictions on, on, on movement, on public yeah. life. Uh, it only has well, a, f a handful of cases of coronavirus, yes. however. The problem is, I think, that all the member states do as they please. There's, you know, very little coordination. Um, there is an attempt to coordinate from the Commission side. I know that very well, but it's mm. very difficult to keep the member states on the same line. And so, you know, they all take their own measures. Um, now, I'm living in a, in a complicated country, Belgium, where even the regions take different measures or have been hesitant mm. and one more proactive than the other. And what we have seen is that the population, you know, the civil society, themselves have started taking measures because, you know, the, the government, the politicians did not dare to take the measures that But there's a caretaker that are government here in Belgium right now. How much of a problem is that for Sorry? dealing with the crisis? There is a caretaker government here in Belgium right now. How much yeah, of a problem well, is that? It, it is not making things more easy because you need a lot of coordination between the federal and the regional levels and that doesn't always go smoothly. And there's a lot of political factors that, you know, play a role. I think right now what we need is listening 
listen to the experts, to the doctors that really say if we don't do enough now, we, you know, will have the consequences later. We have learned a lot. I mean, there was a good article in the JAMA a couple of years ago on the Spanish uh, uh, flu epidemic of 100 years ago, where you saw that all the states, all the cities that took the most drastic measures from the beginning had le the less casualties and, and least mm -hmm. of the casualties. So you really have to put people in quarantine, keep them at home, make sure that they do not infect others, because it is people without mm -hmm. symptoms that spread the virus. Once you have symptoms, it's clear, you stay at home. You have been infecting people before. Mm -hmm. So this is what we have to fight. Well, this brings us to a big mm -hmm. question about a, a, a drastic decision that was taken by a non-European country, the United States, Donald yes. Trump decreeing a ban on most European citizens travelling to the United States, uh, particularly the Schengen zone countries, mm -hmm. so not the UK, Ireland, Cyprus, for example. Uh, is this an acceptable reaction, an overreaction? I'll, I'll say two things. First of all, um, when you read the American press, you can see a lot of measures that Donald Trump has not been taking in the US themselves for which he might be to blame himself. What That's kind of one. Uh, not, not taking the measures that is, are necessary, not taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I will recall you that at the beginning, lots of people thought this was nothing. This was just like the flu mm -hmm. and people were making fun of, mm -hmm. of all the measures that you know, were, were being put in place. Donald Trump was one of them. So uh, blaming the EU and the Schengen zone is, is of course because he is a person that always wants to look at, at somebody else to be guilty. Secondly, you know, there was never a restriction with China, that, which is interesting. You know, you can fly from and to China, uh, to the US, but you cannot from Europe. So this is, this is playing a little game because the UK is exempted. Of course, it's not a member of the EU anymore. So UK citizens can still, he's playing a game. He's, he's trying to put the, the blame on, on the EU. And I think it's irresponsible because this is a global crisis. This is actually what the, the WHO has been calling mm. a pandemic, that means Nobody will be spared from that virus. Also, the US will not. And this is a ridiculous measure. So you think it doesn't make sense to exclude the UK and Ireland? <laughs> well, if you really want to, to restrict uh, tr uh, you know, the travelling and, and the airplanes coming from elsewhere in the world, you should have a list of countries that are affected. Uh, and it would not indeed be uh, sensible to, to exclude the UK. And you could put Japan and Iran and China and other areas as well on your list. So it is really targeting the EU for no reason at all. Let's look at uh, how the European Union and its member states are coordinating or perhaps not coordinating mm. in the fight to limit the impact of this novel coronavirus. Uh, on Tuesday, European Union leaders uh, got together on a video conference and promised that they would work together. Uh, Mario Sufus from France 24 has got more for us about this draft plan. Vowing to stand united in the fight against coronavirus, EU leaders spoke via video link on Tuesday, setting out the bloc's priorities and pledges going forward. We need to work together and to do everything necessary and to act swiftly. It's a strong message shared by the member states. Member states agreed that our citizens' health is the first priority and that measures should be based on science and medical advice. As of Monday, all 27 member states now have confirmed cases of the virus. Four main priorities were outlined during the call, limiting the spread of the virus, the provision of medical equipment, promoting research and tackling the socio-economic consequences of COVID-19. In an effort to better coordinate national measures, EU health and interior ministers have pledged to communicate on a daily basis. EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen also announced the launch of a fund already seeded with $7.5 billion to help member states tackle the spread of coronavirus. We werden alle uns zur Verfügung stehenden Mittel nutzen, damit die europäische Wirtschaft diesem Sturm widersteht. We will bring forward a Corona Response Investment Fund directed at the healthcare systems, directed at SMEs, and as the labor market, at the labor markets, and other vulnerable parts of our economies. The instrument will be sizable and reach 25 billion euros quickly. Despite Tuesday's announcement of a coordinated effort, cracks have begun to appear in the EU's commitment to freedom of movement. 
In response to Italy's nationwide lockdown, Slovenia has closed its border with its neighbour, while Austria has announced that any Italian citizens crossing over its southern border would need a medical certificate from a doctor proving their good health. And Pedro de Sutter, that report by Maria Sofas there, talking about the sort of attempts at coordinated mm -hmm. approaches by the EU, but cracks, differences. Uh, should there just be a strong message from Ursula von der Leyen? You need to ramp up your measures now. Yes, I think there should. Um, this is illustrating, first of all, um, that the EU, the Commission, uh, we also saw Charles Michel, but I would target the Commission first, are really doing their best, trying to... Uh, take the measures that are needed, give the advice, uh, make the funds available and so on and try to coordinate. Mm. It's the member states that take individual measures that go one against the other, um, free movement of goods. Um, as you know, I'm chairing the IMCO committee, the Internal Market Committee. This is of big concern mm. if some countries like France, uh, Germany, uh, Czech Republic and so on are putting barriers on the export of you know, protection equipment or medical devices because they say we might not have enough. Uh, instead of coordinating that and showing solidarity with other member states where the need might be higher, that reminds us of what happened with the refugee crisis where the same reaction mm. occurred where member states are first and foremost thinking about their own safety, security, profits, and then mm. only afterwards they're willing to show solidarity. It's, it's a pity to see that it happens again. There are voices like uh, your fellow Belgian Guy Verhofstadt, the mm -hmm. former Prime Minister of Belgium uh, from the Centrist Renew Europe group, who says that, you know, this kind of crisis, the migration crisis as well, shows that actually more Europe is needed, a, a more federal Europe. Of course. Uh, well, yeah, you can talk about which model it should be. Um, I think one of the problems is that some competences are not at the European level mm. or that you need unanimity in the Council. I mean, we know that for certain areas. Because that's what it would mean, wouldn't it? Yes. It would mean the Member States agreeing to hand over some of their sovereignty of to the European Union. Yes, and they should understand it is to the benefit of everyone. I mean, it's not by closing your borders and thinking about your own supplies that you will really protect your population because you might be in need of something else that you don't have, but another member state has. Mm -mm. If every member state behaves like that, it will indeed fragment the internal market, but also it will affect the public health in all the member states. And let's not forget unless the migration crisis, this is a health crisis, a public health crisis that we have to fight uh, first and mm. foremost. We have to contain that virus and do everything where it's possible to do that. Viruses do not know borders. They don't care. They go wherever they want. So measures should be reasonable, should be, should be science and evidence based and should be based on solidarity if we want to mean anything seriously as a European Union. OK, we've just got a couple of minutes left. I'd like to move on to a couple of other topics. Um, yes. and another crisis we've spoken about, the migration situation. Mm. And now we've seen uh, what's been going on the borders between Bulgaria, Greece and, and Turkey, migrants being pushed from one side to the other. Yeah. Um, there was a deal struck in 2016 between the EU and Turkey, uh, but that seems to be falling apart right now. Now, your Greens group has advocated coming together with a, a new coordinated migrant plan, mm. but... That has been tried before and failed. Political and public discourse seems to show a very strong resistance to allowing more asylum seekers to enter the EU. Yeah, I agree that this is what uh, public opinion thinks and where we are now. Uh, but we will continue repeating that this is also an issue of human rights and of humanitarian uh, issues for these refugees. They are being used. We did not like, and there I would disagree with Mrs. von der Leyen, the usage of a word like shield, mm -hmm. when she visited the border saying that Greece now is the shield against these migrants. That's not the way of talking about human beings who were misled, mm. who were brought there by the Turkish and, and offered an open border to the EU. And so these people were, are victims. They're not offenders. They don't have to be looked at as they are some kind of arms that are threatening us. These are victims. So I understand that right now we're not in the, in the space, in, in the public opinion, thinking about these people as people in need. But, you know... Um, stopping the asylum right for one month, like Greece has mm -hmm. 
been doing, um, this, this really goes against international treaties, against human rights principles, which are part of our European values. We always discuss mm. these values as the standards of what we want to be, uh, also geopolitically in the world, and we don't apply that. So I really regret very much. I think we have to think on the long term about a common asylum and migration policy for Europe. We really have to step up there, mm. review the Dublin, Dublin system and take into consideration all aspects, the causes of migration, mm -hmm. of course, protecting our borders, yes, of course, but also helping people that are drowning in the Mediterranean or wherever and, and you know, look, look at what's happening on the Greek islands today. This is horrible, this is really horrible what happens there. We've just got time to talk about one other major, major issue for the EU and for your uh, group, the Greens, uh, climate change. When the yeah. new commission took office, it was the big priority. You had the Green Deal announced and everything. Uh, is you, do you feel that that's been pushed aside by these twin crises of coronavirus and migration? Well, yes. When we, when we started, and until a, a month ago, it was all the Green Deal and, uh, you know, AI and the digital. And now we are talking about mm. the, the refugees at the, at the border and, and the coronavirus. Of course, the climate... Uh, will not the change will not stop because of corona uh, we'll have to think about it in the future and be ready for that and we have you know been critical about the climate law proposals that we saw from the commission because we think it's like an empty box there is no real commitments no aims uh, you know for 2030 and the commission you know uh, has has been so as hesitant. a group, you'll be putting more pressure on the we, I think we will. States, the Parliament and the Greens in Parliament will do that. And of course, we'll have to convince the member states. We have to step up. We have to go for at least minus 55 mm. in 2030. And that should be binding. And so we want this to be done before summer, if possible. We'll have to wait and see, of course. Thank you so much for being yeah. our guest on Talking Europe. Petra de Souter, Belgian MEP, as I said, with the Greens group. Thanks to you as well for being with us for this programme. Hope to see you soon here on France 24. Special event. 900,000 candidates running to become France's 35,000 mayors, the grassroots of the country's democracy. The biggest prize, of course, is Paris, where I will be covering the race between Emmanuel Macron's candidate, a former minister from Nicolas Sarkozy's 2007 government, and the incumbent socialist mayor. And I'll be in the Normandy city of Le Havre, where it's a test for the government. Will the Prime Minister, Edouard Philippe, get re-elected in his local stronghold? And join me in the south of France, where Marine Le Pen's national rally has high hopes of taking control of Perpignan. These elections are a snapshot of French politics and they set the stage for the 2022 presidential election. All the results in our special coverage on France 24 and France24.com. Watch events unfold on France 24 and France24.com.